With the Michigan primary election just two days away, Republican presidential candidate Ron Paul was in the small town of Hudsonville in the western part of the state. The Texas representative spoke with small business owners at this hour and five minute event. Adam D'Angeli, I'm the Michigan coordinator for the campaign. I'll be the MC tonight, and we have a wonderful program for you this afternoon. Before we begin, I want to go over a few things, though, for the benefit of uh, our actual campaign, which is Election Day coming up in two days. There are things we need to know, and I want to make sure that everybody here who supports Ron Paul is totally aware of these things. Number one, Michigan is a primary state. I know you've heard a lot about delegates and a lot about how the media is manipulating people into thinking that these straw votes in some other states don't matter. But in Michigan, we are bound by the primary in the first round in the general election, guys. So we need to win this primary on, on, on Tuesday. So we need every Ron Paul supporter to make sure that every other Ron Paul supporter out there knows that they need to turn out on election day. Number two, we need every Ron Paul supporter to understand that despite what you may have heard in the media, Michigan has an open primary, which means that if you are registered to vote in Michigan, you can vote on election day this Tuesday, two days from today. The polls open at 7 a.m. and the polls close at 8 p.m. And to win this election, we need to make sure that every single Ron Paul supporter out there is mobilized on election day so we can win districts and perhaps even the entire state of Michigan for Ron Paul. Yeah. And here's what you can do. Here's what you can do to make sure that that actually does happen. What you can do, number one, make a list of everybody in Michigan you know. That means not just the people you've spoken with this week, the people you went to high school with, the people you went to college with, the people you're in the service with, the people you go to church with, everybody. And you call them on the phone and you ask them to vote for Ron Paul this election coming up on Tuesday. And if they say yes, then you make sure that they know to vote on, super, on, on election day this Tuesday. And if they say they're undecided, you persuade them to vote for Dr. Paul. And you talk to them on their issues, on their terms. And if by chance they say that they're more concerned about the little squabble between Mitt Romney and Rick Santorum, you point out that there's not really a dime's worth of difference between those two candidates. And it doesn't really matter which one of them wins on, super, on this Tuesday, but that Ron Paul wins on, on Tuesday. So with that, we have a lot going on today. I want to um, thank everyone for coming and for our guests that are here. I'm proud to have had some say in some of the events that we've put together here. And one of our speakers is a member of an organization called Union Conservatives, union members who are tired of not having the choice to pay dues to a union or refrain from doing so. And that's a very important issue in Michigan where Indiana has just been given that, that choice. And we need something like that to prevent Indiana from becoming the jobs magnet of the Midwest. So please welcome Terry Bowman. everyone. I am so excited to be here on such a great day in Hudsonville for Ron Paul. I am a UAW member and have been for 15 years, believe it or not. And uh, I'm the president and founder of an organization called Union Conservatives, a First Amendment or organization that believes that every union member has a right to voice their opinion without fear of persecution, harassment, or ridicule. So a lot of you may be asking, Union Conservatives, that sounds like a contradiction. Is it? 40% of union members do not vote the way their union bosses demand them to vote. They vote their own conscience. They vote the way that they believe they should vote. That equates to over 6 million union members in the United States alone who are harassed, ridiculed, and persecuted because of their political beliefs. Now, we formed in 2010 um, with our three principles, which is basically uh, strengthening unions through conservative principles, building an organization of truth-seeking voices, and bridging the gap, very important, between union members and liberty, because they do not have liberty on the union shop floor. So we're a First Amendment organization dedicated to bringing unions back from the spiral of far-left political activism that is spinning them to the edge of destruction. And one of our biggest issues is the right to work issue. Because we believe that all workers, union workers, all workers should have the right to choose whether or not to financially support a third party as a condition of employment. So we're pushing the right to work issue in Michigan. We're out there 
fighting for workers to be able to um, to choose for themselves whether the freedom of association or the freedom conversely to not associate with unions. So um, if you're a believer in freedom in Michigan, if you're a believer in liberty in Michigan, right to work is where we need to go. And we are so thankful that the Ron Paul campaign fights for these freedoms for workers all around the country. So we are so proud to be here today. With, and uh, one thing you can do is to contact Governor Snyder because Governor Snyder, even though he has said in the past that he would sign a right to work bill if it comes across his desk, he is backpedaling a little bit and saying that he doesn't even want to see it come across his desk. So you as the grassroots parts of Michigan need to contact Governor Snyder's office and say, we believe in the First Amendment, we believe that workers should have the right to choose and it's a jobs issue, it's a freedom issue and it's a choice issue. So if you could help us with that, and uh, we, again, we thank the Ron Paul campaign for all the hard work that they do and, and uh, supporting union conservatives. So thank you so much, and let's have a great day today with the Ron Paul campaign. That's standing strong on right to work. Our next guest is uh, Brett Vanderkamp. And he's going to introduce small business owners for Ron Paul in Michigan. I'm very proud of this organization because for all the candidates and their talk of how much they care about small businesses, it seems to me that it's usually big business that the ones they answer to at the end of the day. So here to introduce small business owners for Ron Paul, please give it up for Brett Vanderkamp. Awesome. It's great to be in a, a room full of liberty-loving folks and friends. So I'm just thrilled to be here. I'm here. Uh, my name is Brett Vanderkamp, uh, president and founder of New Holland Brewing Company in Holland. Yeah. I, I like to say we've been brewing up liberty for 15 years. So thank you so much for being here. Hey, but I'm here to endorse, uh, uh, officially endorse Ron Paul today, Dr. Paul, um, and I'm here with some of my friends. Uh, small business owners here in Michigan, and uh, you can applaud them as they're coming up. I just want to give them some of the kudos they deserve as being kind of uh, on the front lines, kind of heroes of commerce here in West Michigan and beyond. So real quickly, as I'm going to call their name, if you could just, you want to give them applause while they come up, you can, or you can wait at the end and give a round of applause, and then we'll get on to the good doctor. So we got uh, Zach Wendt from Remax. Yeah. Kevin Sagasso, Sagasso and Associates. Tim Sawyer, Amsoil, Synthetic Oils, Ann Webster, Big Lyles, Big Events, Jim Cambridge, Cambridge Barrel Drilling, Jim Thwaites, Hickory Engineering, Dr. Mike Lubke, MD, Medical Doctor, Mark Vincent, Wolverine Power Ship, David Dems, Planet Bulb, Ryan Mask, Rush Creek Designs, Mike Phillips, Emergency Plumbing Service, Melanie Collinsworth, About Face Media, Richard Pico, Communications Group, and Lisa Wallace, who's an independent researcher, and last but not least, Sean Miller of the Performance Institute. Let's give a round of applause, everybody. Right on. The good doctor's up next. We're going to exit stage right here, and we'll get right to the main show. Congressman, please give it up for Congressman Justin Amash, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. What, what an outstanding crowd. And I know uh, many of you here are here from over in the third district. And you helped send me to Congress, so let's help send Ron Paul to the White House. I, I had the uh, honor and privilege of introducing Ron Paul last night at an event featuring our military veterans and service members uh, who were supporting Ron Paul. And how many of you know that Ron Paul has more support from service members than all of the candidates combined? <laughs> and
And, and I think there's a, there's a good reason why the service members support him. Uh, Ron and I swore an oath to support and defend the Constitution just as they did. And they understand... Our service members and our veterans understand the importance of a constitutional foreign policy. They understand that when we go to war, we have to declare war. That Congress must be the one that authorizes the war, not just the President. And they understand the importance of protecting our civil liberties. They understand the problems with the Unpatriotic Patriot Act. Yeah. Yeah. Like Ron and me, they are opposed to the NDAA, which has indefinite detention provisions. Yeah. The, our government should not be allowed to lock you up without charge or trial. They should have to go through the constitutional process. One of the things I admire most about Ron Paul is his consistency. Uh, for those of you who have been watching the debates, you see how many times the other candidates have to apologize for their past votes. <laughs> it's, it seems like every debate uh, someone has to apologize for something new. Why did they support government-run health care? Why did they support No Child Left Behind? Why did they support cap and trade? Why were they uh, opposed to right to work? Why did they vote to increase the debt ceiling? Every time, <laughs> every time we have one of these debates, they have to apologize. Ron Paul has never had to apologize for his voting record. You may have recently seen uh, that a nonpartisan group did a, a study of the budget proposals from the various Republican candidates. And three of the four candidates offered, a budget, uh, offered budget proposals that would increase the debt. Only one of the four had a budget proposal that would decrease the debt. Do you know who that is? Ron Paul has had a real impact on the Republican Party. It's brought liberty-minded people into the party like me. It's really changing the fabric of the party. If you look at young people, more young people support Ron Paul than any other Republican candidate by far. <laughs> and, and these young liberty-minded Republicans are the future of the Republican Party. So I want to now uh, welcome Ron Paul to the stage. Um, he's here with his wife, Carol, so let's, let's give it up for Ron Paul. I'm so glad to see so many people here. <laughs> Sounds exciting. Sounds like we have something really going right now. <laughs> but before I get started, I do want to uh, certainly recognize Justin Amash for that. Very nice introduction. And he makes it so much less lonely in Washington <laughs> these days. <laughs> And, and, and Justin, you know, has been been there just the first term, but it, it uh, you know, followed up from, I met him about four years ago. So the, the country is changing, the Congress is changing, but we have a lot more to do. What I say quite frequently, the people are way ahead of the Congress. Congress is still asleep, and that is our job to wake up Congress and the entire Washington. So it's a pleasure to be in the hometown of my brother, uh, Dave Paul. He's a minister here in Hudsonville, and he's with me today. He, um, 
He has some of his grandchildren. I have one of my grandchildren here. Lisa, Linda is with me today. This is Linda. But then, then uh, I brought my wife along, and I think a few of you have met my wife, Carol. <laughs> But it is, it is so nice to see such a nice crowd. Um, in Washington, I would on occasion give speeches on the House floor, but I never got applause, so that's why I like to give speeches outside Washington. <laughs> it's, it's much more fun. <laughs> but uh, like I said, uh, the country is much further ahead, and I think this has been true for a long time. The people are way ahead of the Congress. I figure Congress is about 20 years behind, but what we need to do is turn the clock up, speed it up a little bit. We need changes quicker now than ever before. Before. For years, for years, I used to say, and a lot of people still say it, and it's, there's some truth to it, and that is that we can't speak, keep spending this money and borrowing the money, or we're going to pass this debt on to our children. But I don't say I don't say that as much anymore because I think this the next generation that was going to get this debt passed on to. I think we are that generation that inherited the problems of the last 40 years, and that's why we have to deal with our problems right now. <laughs> If I were to uh, simplify our problems, I would say that we've gotten to this mess because we have sent too many people to Washington uh, that have not taken their oath of office seriously and uh, have not uh, done what they should have. I think the people have been lax. They, they keep getting them reelected. So it's not all just the Congress and just the President. The people have been uh, lax as well. But w we need to, you know, change this by changing the people's attitude about what the government should be doing. And let me tell you, the government under our Constitution is not supposed to be running a welfare state nor a warfare state. It's there to protect our liberties. That's what the job is. Most people recognize the crisis now mainly for economic reasons. Four or five years ago, you know, the bubble burst. A few of us talked about that over the years, especially the Austrian free market economists. They have been right on their predictions and they have predicted that this would come and it did come. But uh, now uh, most of the people realize, not only in this country but around the world, this is not a U.S. problem because we're living with a problem that has been developed differently than ever before because we have been the issuer of a fiat currency called the dollar. And the dollar has been used as a reserve currency as if it were gold. And therefore the inflationary problems of the world and all the distortions and all the debt crisis is worldwide and therefore we're facing this a, a crisis bigger than ever. So the recognition is there. And this is, this is not all that bad because it's when people live with their head in the sand that we keep doing the same thing over and over again. Again. And right now, people are waking up and saying, you can't solve the problem of too much spending and too much borrowing and too much debt and too much printing press money by merely doing the same thing over and over again. So that's why I'm optimistic that the people know now that we can't continue on the same course that we have been doing for at least the last 40 to 50 years. Yeah. The, the economy is obviously the big issue, and certainly in a state like Michigan, that is the big issue, and uh, it has to be addressed. Some states do better than other states. There are some states in the south that do better than the states in the north, and, 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 and it's not all accident. The federal government does a lousy job providing the environment necessary to be competitive and to uh, be able to compete in, throughout the world because they overtax, they overregulate and they distort the economy with the inflation, distort the interest rates. So the federal government has a lot of responsibility. In particular, there's one group of people that we should deal with, and I'll talk more about that, and that is that group that's located over in the Federal Reserve Building that we have to deal with.
now that you want to talk about the Federal Reserve System, uh, you know, it's been there, it's been around for 99 years and they've literally destroyed 99% of the dollar they inherited in 1913. So they're doing a wonderful job and one of their mandates is st one of their mandates is a stable dollar and stable prices. I don't think they've done a very good job. The other mandate they have is, uh, is low unemployment, and they haven't done a very good job there either. But, but the, the problems that the Federal Reserve, uh, the Federal Reserve and uh, the federal government with the mandates and the regulations and all that, that's a big thing. But some states suffer more because some states put a greater burden because you have local regulations. And I think the issue mentioned in the introduction it is a big issue, and that is the uh, cost of labor. The cost of labor should be competitive. People should be able to, uh, you know, negotiate. And, and the contract is what's supposed to uh, deal, uh, decide how workers come together and business people come together. There should be no laws prohibiting the uh, organization of labor. Labor should have a right to organize and talk. And then they have a right to negotiate with business and business and labor should come together. This is the way a market would work. Who knows, in a totally free market, you might have competitive unions for all that we know to try to compete for the best job and provide the best, uh, best workers. But it's when, it's in 1935 when they didn't understand the depression. They, they claimed the depression came about because of free markets, capitalism, and the gold standard. So therefore, what did they do? They destroyed the gold standard and brought up a lot more regulations and destroyed the free market and gave us this intervention Keynesianism which we've been living with uh, for a long long time but uh in, in 1935, they gave us the National Labor Relations Act, and uh, this this uh, distorted the balance. It didn't deal with uh, you know the right to organize and the right to contract. It said if you want to get together and organize, you have special power. So when they talk about getting workers' rights back, I think they're misleading because they're not rights to get a clout from the government. Now, big business gets clouts too, and that's wrong. But big labor is not supposed to get bigger power. Now the compensation had, that has a concern over the years have states have gone and tried to get around this by having right to work laws and try to compensate for the special powers uh, that have been granted to, to, to the unions. So this is uh, this distorts the market and the states that have not compensated they have suffered the very most and therefore it can't uh, it, it has to be uh, addressed. Now I support a national uh, right to work law and some of the other candidates do not support that law, even though they are conservative Republicans. <laughs> but it's in, the first question that should come if, they, if somebody wants to challenge you says, well, how can you support a national law? You don't believe in these national laws. What's going on? Well, actually, it isn't a new law, new process. It's to cancel out that special authority. It's to remove a special power and cloud that was given in the 1935. So that would be a big help for a state like this if, if the economy, if you want to get the economy moving again. I just think of the companies that got into trouble in this, in this breakdown uh, just four or five years ago, the auto companies that got into trouble, there were a lot of auto, auto companies that were in the south run by other co companies and they didn't have the same problem. So uh, to put our head in the sand and say that uh, this has to happen uh, and, and persist. But even the bailouts of the company, it, it wasn't, once again, governments are supposed to be there to guarantee con contracts, protect contracts, enforce contracts. So what did the government do come in when they bailed out? They took money from people they shouldn't have taken money to and then given the money and the bailout and protected individuals that didn't deserve the protection. So the government should be restrained to protecting contract, protecting the marketplace, protecting private property, and they ought to reduce the amount of regulations and they ought to give us a sound currency. That's what would help our economy today. <laughs> Thank you.
The other major problem we have faced these last five years is the inability of politicians to allow the correction to occur. Corrections, when mistakes are made, you're supposed to have a correction. But nobody wants to, uh, you know, go through the correction. So they say, well, what we have to do is bail out companies and the various things uh, because the correction is the way they say too painful. If you don't have the bailouts, there's going to be a depression. And there was some truth to that. The people who had overextended, who who, uh, especially in the housing bubble, abused it, got into the derivatives market, and they were gambling with all these, these derivatives. Yes, they were in big trouble, and the banks owned them, and, and all the insurance companies and the banks were very much involved. So they said, there's going to be a crisis. It's going to be major. They're too big to fail. Well, the truth, the truth is, the free market tries to correct the problems of government. They should have failed. They're the ones who should have failed, not... <laughs> But instead, what happened is the, the Congress, as well as the Federal Reserve, went and bought, bought up all the bad debt. They didn't liquidate the debt. If you or I get into trouble and we're in our heads, over our heads with debt, and we want to have our own economic growth again, we have to get our debt out of the way so that we don't have to keep paying interest and accumulating more and more debt. Or eventually we can't borrow any more money. A country has to do that too. The debt has to be liquidated. But when they bailed out these countries, the debt was propped up. Japan did the same thing 20 years ago and they're still in trouble. So what happened to the debt? Did the companies who held the debt and made all the money, uh, are they stuck with it? No, it's on our shoulders, it's on the middle class America, and that's why middle class America is suffering. And the very people the bleeding hearts wanted to help and give a free house to, guess what? They're the ones who lost their jobs and lost their houses, and they're suffering the consequence of the inflation now. So government intervention and government planning, whether it's through the Federal Reserve or through Congress, doesn't work. The people have to plan. The people may have to decide how the money is being spent, not the government and not the politicians and not the bureaucrats. Today, though, we have not resolved that, and it is yet to come because this debt is still hanging. Not only that, is our government, our Secretary of the Treasury, as well as the Federal Reserve, have traveled quite frequently, and they talk to the Europeans all the time, and they have essentially promised that we will bail out Europe because we have the reserve currency and there's still some trust in the dollar. So they have essentially said, we will be there. We will not let those banks fail. Guess who the banks are? They're big banks that we have that have branch banks over there. They're intertwined, they're global in nature. And guess what? The banks and the branches in Europe, guess what they bought? They bought debt from Greece and Portugal and, and Spain. And they say, well, the debt is illiquid now. What are we gonna do? Illiquid means it's worthless. <laughs> But they own it. They don't want to go bankrupt. So we're over there promising more that we will be bailing them out by printing more money. But the, the, the tough part of this, and they better wake up and understand it, is that you just can't do that forever. Eventually what it does, it destroys the confidence in the dollar. And right now I think that is happening. Because now the money is starting to circulate. It's been produced and created in the last four or five years. You've heard about gasoline prices. There's one place in Florida, gasoline prices hit $6 the other day. And, uh, and yet, what, what does Bernanke tell us? Bernanke tells us there's no inflation. Of course, he has, a different, he has a different definition of inflation. Inflation, technically, in the free market is when you print, print money and create money. He's tripled the supply of money in these last three years. That's inflation. And then one of the consequences of inflating the currency are higher prices. So over the years, what have we had? We had high prices in the NASDAQ bubble, and we had high prices in the, in the housing bubble. We have high prices wherever government gets their fingers involved in education, prices of education, much higher than the cost of living, cost of medical care it's it's uh, very very high and uh, th this and, and then they tell you you know that there, there isn't any inflation but even if you use the old uh, col uh, the old calculation for the CPI the uh, our price is going up about seven percent he's telling us it's going up two percent so in, in other words let's say it is two percent what he's telling us is that they're allowed to steal 
two percent of our money every single year and then and not be not be charged with a crime <laughs> Matter of fact, I've asked both Greenspan and Bernanke in committee about this, about the morality of it and the economics of it. And they said, well, we have to keep interest rates low. We have to do this to keep the economy going. We have to look at the big picture. And some, and some people just are going to suffer. Now, that, that is not very nice. <laughs> Because guess who suffers? The very people who might want to take care of themselves, the people who save money, the people in retirement, people living on Social Security, because their cost of living right now is going up a lot more than, than 2%. So he says that's a consequence. Now, if you had a free market, you know what people might make on their CDs? It could be 6 or 7 or 8% because that's where the market would be. And, uh, the, but the, the other major problem when the Fed gets involved in artificially low, lower interest rates, it causes what we call malinvestment. People do things they shouldn't be doing. Even if you don't see the prices rising, they invest because they think there's been a lot of savings. They might build too many houses or build too many casinos down in Las Vegas and all the different things. So this is the mischief of the Federal Reserve and uh, eventually it'll be dealt with. This is not new. Destruction of money has been around for a long time and inevitably when they finally destroy the currency, they always have to go back to something that people know about and they trust and they go back just as the founders went back. They had runaway inflation with the continental dollar. They put in the Constitution, only gold and silver can be legal tender. And they, also, and they also said you could not e emit bills of credit, which is paper money. And they also said, we give you no authority to establish a central bank. Now, immediately there was a great debate between Jefferson and Hamilton. Uh, and uh, in the early years, of course, uh, uh, they kept e getting rid of the national bank. But uh, we've been suffering with this for the, la uh, you know, the last hundred years. So uh, I'm hoping on the 100th anniversary that we have a bill that we can pass that says uh, on the 100th anniversary of the Federal Reserve, we're going to have a bill that's going to repeal the Federal Reserve Act. <laughs> The other major flaw with a monetary system like this, it enables governments to grow in a sinister manner. If you, Jefferson didn't want to even be able to borrow money, but he, he didn't win that fight. But if they tax this for everything that they do, and we had to send them a check every month, believe me, this would all end rather quickly because the people would rebel. Matter of fact, just uh, to make that point, I introduced a bill one time to repeal withholding taxes. Why should the businessman be a slave? and collect those these papers and fill out all these forms <laughs> but but the the real, the real benefit would be the people would know how much they're paying for the government and there would be a quick rebellion that would get us back on track again <laughs> But because the uh, borrowing can become noticeable, if you didn't have the Fed to monetize debt, the borrowing would push interest rates up, and then the Congress would have to quit spending because uh, the more they spent, the higher the interest rates would go up. But we don't have that check. And so we have the Federal Reserve that just prints the money when the federal government uh, n needs the money. So it does hide things, and the victims are sometimes unknown. There's not known immediately, and, uh, and, and they can get away with that until the end point when the, uh, when the currency is destroyed. But in the meantime, you might have decades of this. We've, we went off the gold standard completely in 1971. These last 40 years have been nothing but a big bubble uh, being formed. But during that time, just think of what has grown. The entitlement system and the warfare system. The military industrial complex that Eisenhower war warned us about. It's alive and well and they're spending money. And the, the thing that really, even though I've studied this for a long time I've been in Congress and I know how so many of you feel uh, they're, they're, they're living with their head in the sand. They're in oblivion in Washington. They don't even, if they thought that the problem was one-tenth as serious as I think that, uh, that it is, they would quit spending. That's what they should do.
But the whole system fed on itself. The entitlement system is uh, alive and well. Politicians did quite well um, by, you know, just promising whatever the people wanted. We could borrow, spend. We're a wealthy nation. And we were. We were the wealthiest nation ever because we were the freest nation. Of course, today, we're not the freest nation and we're not the richest nation uh, anymore. But the entitlement system got way off base because entitlement sounds like a good, good word. You know, uh, we're we're, we would like to say we're entitled to our right to our life and to, and to our liberties, but we're not entitled to somebody else's money. <laughs> Enti entitlements have become what people through the politician demand or want or insist on, and the politicians accommodate, and they become entitlements. And literally, I imagine more than 50% of the people in this country still think that an entitlement is a right, but an entitlement isn't a right. We get our lives and our liberty from our Creator. We get it in a natural way. <laughs> We don't get it, we don't get it from, from the government, but if we have a right to our life and our liberties, we ought to have a right to keep the fruits of our labor. <laughs> Which of course means there would be no income tax if you could live with that. <laughs> You know, a lot of people will, will challenge me, of course, because uh, I, want, I want to start off the first year with, uh, you know, a token cut of one trillion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> And quite frequently, the questions are very sincere because they've studied only Keynesian economics. And I say, well, what will happen? We're in a recession. What would happen if the government quit spending a trillion dollars? I said, well, think of it this way. It isn't so much that the government's going to, the fact that the government's quit and spend a trillion dollars, it would be that the government would quit spending it and the people would spend the trillion dollars. <laughs> And that's, and that's what would happen, and that would be much better. I, quite frankly, am very frank about what I think the nature and the uh, philosophy of a president ought to be. The president shouldn't be running the economy. You know, uh, it's, uh, the president doesn't know what to do. The Congress doesn't know what to do. Only the people know what to do on how to run the economy. <laughs> Now, I don't say that we can get out of this mess by snapping our fingers and everything will be perfect, but I know what we're doing is wrong, is prolonging the agony, and it's going to be worse in our depression if we don't uh, change our ways. But what, uh, what we need to do, though, is not scare people with what the correction is all about. Because I don't think we should propose our viewpoints by saying, well, I have the problems as long as you're willing to sacrifice. But why would it be that if I came along and talked to the businessman and to you in this, in this audience and say, look, what I want to do is I want to deregulate you. I don't want the federal government down in your states and having mandates. I don't think that's a sacrifice to have less regulations from the federal government. <laughs> And how would it be a sacrifice to you if, it could, if you could trust the currency? How many here now would say, well, I'm saving for my ch children's education. I'm going to buy a 20-year bond and make a half a percent or a quarter percent, and now I know I'll have the purchasing power in 20 years. Nobody believes that. You, you know? So what if you had sound money and you could save money and you could be confident that you can take care of your future? What else, not only that, the prices of education would come down. But why would it be a sacrifice? to us if you didn't have any income tax. That doesn't sound like a sacrifice to me. I would think this would be wonderful. <laughs> Well, 
But not only would we have to change, the people have to change their attitude about what the role of government ought to be. And that is important because no matter how many people you have in Washington, they, they will reflect the demands of the people. So if the, if the people still say entitlements are rights and we want to uh, steal money from one group and you give it to us, it's not going to work. So in, we have to change the people's attitude about the role of government. But there's another area that we have to at least address and I believe we have to change to get this correction over with. And that has to do with what we're doing overseas. We're spending, the DOD budget's not this big, but believe me, there are a lot of other budgets that are involved in what we're doing overseas. The, the intervention, the State Department, the CIA, uh, our troops, and taking care of the wounded and all, it's costing us over a trillion dollars. Our wars in the last 10 years, 10, 11 years now, has added $4 trillion worth of debt to our, our national debt. But just think of, what if we'd have had this $4 trillion in the economy? Just think how much richer this economy would be. And what have we gotten for all these wars? We've gotten nothing but grief. I mean, we're not spreading our Constitution. We're not spreading our goodness. We're spreading a viewpoint of America, which I don't think is a good viewpoint of America. I. <laughs> A lot, of, a lot of people believe they have a moral obligation, starting with Woodrow Wilson, that we had to prove to the world that uh, uh, we were the most moral and, and, and most uh, wise nation, and we had, the, we had the right and the obligation to force our way and, uh, and, and to teach other people. They, this, this, though, doesn't work. Using force to force our goodness on a, anybody cancels out all the goodness. If you... Now America America has been a great country, the freest and the richest, and we have a, a lot of wonderful traits and wonderful characteristics that we want to. But why don't we concentrate on a free market economy, a sound currency, protection of civil liberties, a sensible foreign policy, and then we could be a nation where other countries would want to emulate us and follow our lead. <laughs> But unless we change our attitude, and that means the people, about how, how much we should be involved overseas, it's not going to happen. We're going to work to the bankruptcy, and that's not real far off. So my, my position is that it should be a lot easier for liberals and conservatives and independents to come together and cut overseas spending and cut these wars. That's what I think would be the easiest thing to cut. Which, which simply means we bring our troops home as soon as possible. The other, the other thing about this is that um, it's a way to work our way out of it. If we don't work our way out of it and have a dollar collapse, everybody's checks bounce. And, and then you have political chaos, and then I worry about our civil liberties. But if, uh, if we do this sensibly and cut this spending overseas, what, what about all this effort to worry about a border that nobody can identify between Pakistan and Afghanistan? Think of how much fighting and killing we're going over there. Nobody even knows where at all, so we just bomb everybody. You know, but uh, what about what about our own borders uh, to to the south? We, you know, there there's a responsibility of the federal government. We could do that with a lot less resources than worrying about all those overseas border. And in the last five years, it is estimated that 50,000 people have been killed on that border down there. And uh, it involves not only, uh, I think, less so the immigration problem than our failed policy on the drug war, I think is part of the reason.
But we once again would have to change our foreign policy and, and adapt the policy that the founders gave us. And even up until the mid part of the last century, many conservative Republicans endorsed. And that is, we ought to mind our own business. And, uh, <laughs> But they'll come up with all, all these arguments, well, there's a civil war going over there and people are getting killed. They have no idea who the good guys and the bad guys are. There's probably bad guys on both sides, but we have to get involved, they say. But how many, how many times did we get involved with the most vicious of dictators, you know, from uh, Stalin to Mao Zedong and all these people, they killed millions, and yet we did business with them. So this whole idea that we, the, there's war propaganda going on, war drums are beating, they're ready to go into Syria. We don't need a war in Syria and we don't need a war in Iran, I'll tell you that. economic advantage of this if we decide to work our way out, which is what I'm working to do. And that is, if you cut back, you don't have to cut child health care, or you don't have to cut benefits to the elderly. Some of those programs should never have been started. I'm not going to defend this stuff on constitutional grounds, but on practical grounds, if you want to deal with this and deal in a practical way, let's cut this spending overseas and try to take care of the people that we have taught for 50 years to become dependent on the federal government. And then work our way out. One of the proposals in my bill is to take care of the people who are dependent and, and need to help. But I would offer the chance, you know, to to change the social security system. And for instance, to start off with anybody under 25 getting out of college, let them get out of social security. Let them take care of themselves. of course wouldn't work unless you do the cutting and that's why we have to change the foreign policy but the founders were very very clear on this and uh, uh, and they advised strongly don't get involved in entangling alliances don't be the policeman of the world and don't uh, uh, don't get involved but their advice was trade with people and talk to people and uh, and, and not try to solve all the, all their other problems but uh, today we we do exactly the opposite I think one of the most foolish examples of putting on sanctions uh, not at the time, but now. Don't you think sanctions on Cuba have been long enough? <laughs> Other countries are doing business with them. Communism is dead. What I'm worried about is the current system of government interventionism and inflationism and the problems we have today. That's our real threat. Besides, Besides, the countries that we do end up trading with, you know, we, the French and the Americans uh, killed a million, uh, probably close to a million or more of the Vietnamese. We finally left. We lost 60,000. And we lost that war. And they said there would be a domino effect and communism would spread throughout the world. It didn't happen. China became our banker. Now we do business with the Vietnamese. And, uh, and, and just think of what's happened since we left there in the 1973 or so. Since we've left there, Think of what happened with peace, what never happened with war. So why are we so determined, this country, to think that it is necessary? And you know, there's an economic theory behind this, which is a dangerous theory. They, the, the claim was that the Depression came because of the gold standard and capitalism. But they didn't, we didn't get out of the Depression until we had World War II. Now that is foolish thinking because war never helps your economy. It never helps. <laughs> Now, 
the reason the reason of the fallacy is there was the unemployment rate went down you know because everybody was over the 10 million people went overseas fighting but a lot of people argue me about uh, with me about my one trillion dollars of cut in spending because they've been taught to Keynesian teaches government's supposed to spend more money when when you're in trouble and uh, uh, they they said that uh, if you do this won't this really hurt the economy but but think think about it if um, if you have a if you have a trillion dollars and you cut it, of course, the, uh, the people are going to get to cut it. But after World War II, 10 million military people came home. We cut the budget by 60%. Taxes went down 30%. That's when the Depression ended. They came back. That's what we, that was the Depression. But when we come around to understanding that we do have a responsibility for strong national defense, we have to have a strong national defense, but the founders tried their best to protect us against the king going to war. But unfortunately, the presidents we've had in recent history have acted like kings, have not gotten the permission from you through your congressmen voting up and down for a war. If we did that, we wouldn't have gone to war, and if we had to go to war, we'd fight them with them and they would come home. You know, the, the Iraq war was fought uh, you know as a consequence or a sequence from 9-11 it had nothing to do with 9-11 because there was no weapons of mass destruction no uh, al-Qaeda al there but when they came up with the resolution I'm, I was on the Iraq uh, on the International Relations Committee the resolution said not a, de a declaration of war they said the president can do whatever he wants it, essentially that if you want to go to war fine if you don't you don't have to and that was how they reneged on the responsibility which sort of upset me a bit and and uh, so I introduced a, a substitute resolution and said, okay, I, I told the, the committee, I said, look, you guys want to go to war? I don't want to go to war. But I'm offering a resolution of a declaration of war. I said, I'm not going to vote for it, but if you want to go to war, you vote it up and down. Of course, oh, they were furious. Oh, no. And then they did voice vote and voted down. I said, I'm going to make you record the vote that you voted against the declaration of war. <laughs> But it was explained to me by the committee chairman of the time that they were trying to uh, explain to me the Constitution. They say, he said, that part of the Constitution is anachronistic. We don't follow that part of the Constitution anymore. That tells you why we're in trouble today because the Constitution doesn't mean a whole lot. They ignore it, they, the, the courts overrule it, and uh, it's, a, it's a real mess. We got into this mess by not following it. We could get out of it by sending only people to Washington that will obey the Constitution. <laughs> The other, the other serious consequence of big government, whether it's uh, for the entitlement welfare system or for the warfare system, because the bigger the government gets, the smaller the people get, the less liberties that we have. It's characteristic under a war that civil liberties are compromised. People, people have uh, sort of accepted this idea, well, under these special emergency conditions, we have to give up a little bit of our liberties. Let me tell you, you don't. You don't have to give up liberties to be safe. But today, today it is said that we, we have a perpetual war, it's worldwide, any country, and we're in 130 countries, nine, 900 bases, because we're fighting a war on terrorism. We're, we're fighting the Taliban. The Taliban are people who just want us out of their country. You know, that's, that's what they want. But, uh, but the war is uh, worldwide, and uh, therefore uh, we should expect that a continuation of an attack on our civil liberties, much worse than I think it's been in the past. Today, of course, immediately after 9-11, I, I voted for the support to go after the Al-Qaeda. That is proper, even though I saw our foreign policies being seriously flawed, contributing to that problem. But they attack us, we got to deal with it, we go get them. But we didn't even catch bin Laden for 10 years, and we went and occupied two countries, and in a country that had zero to do with it. So uh, th this, uh, but what, what did they do to the American people? We suffered from the consequence of that. Within two weeks, they had a 
bill on the floor they had been trying to pass for a couple years, and that bill was called the Patriot Act. <laughs> So that was voted very easily. I was sitting beside a member of Congress on that day and I, I, I saw he was voting for it. I was voting against it. <laughs> voting against it. And uh, I said, why? I said, why, why, why are you voting for this bill? He's, I said, uh, you know it's only been on the floor for an hour. We don't even know exactly what's in it. He said, well, I know that. And I said, you didn't read it. No, I didn't read it. And I said, you know there's going to be bad stuff in there. Yeah, I know that. I said, why are you voting for it? He says, how can I go home and tell my people back at home that I voted for the Patriot Act right after 9-11? He said, that would be a difficult thing to explain. I said, but that's your job. Go home and explain it to them. <laughs> But almost always, if you look at a bill's name on it, coming out of Congress, it's almost inevitable that it's going to do the opposite of what it said. So it was a very unpatriotic bill. If they would have called it the Repeal the Fourth Amendment Act, I guess nobody would have voted for it. So. Next year, next year when we get a chance to uh, repeal this, we won't call it repeal the, the Patriot Act. We'll call it Restore the Fourth Amendment Act. <laughs> Then, then, of course, the TSA couldn't assume that they have a right to search, seed, and prod us all at the airport and sacrifice all our liberties and humiliate it to boot. But you know, a year ago, the president announced in, in this progress against our liberties, he announced that uh, it is a proper procedure for the president of the United States to assassinate American citizens on, 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 his, on his say. And uh, to prove his point, he did it, he's done it three times already. But the Congress is not, hasn't been much better. The Congress uh, passed a bill, he's, the President signed it on January 1st of this year, the uh, National Defense uh, Authorization Act with... Which, which Justin mentioned because he was positively opposed to it as I was. <laughs> but this bill, this bill literally uh, re repeals posse comitatus, keeping the military out of the state uh, civil laws. It allows the military to arrest any American citizen if, he see, if he's associated with any particular group. Just associated. No charges made, no trials. He can be arrested, put in a secret prison, denied an attorney, and kept indefinitely. And that's on the books. We put it on the books. That has to be reversed. <laughs> was pretty bold on what they did but there was one other provision that fortunately was removed there was a provision that was in the bill and nearly passed and it had gone through the house and it was coming out of the Senate but when it was on the Senate floor and the provision said that if you are arrested and you are charged and you have a trial and you're found innocent they could still keep you in a, indefinitely in a prison but fortunately, there was a senator from, I think it was Kentucky, that got that removed. <laughs> I think you knew about all those problems. I don't think I've given you anything new. <laughs> but you've given me some more energy because of enthusiasm, because I know you're out there and there are a lot of people out there and the numbers are growing by leaps and bounds. The revolution. The revolution is alive and well, and it's an intellectual revolution, and let me tell you, there are a lot of young people wanting to lead the charge, and that's great with me. But there, are, there are a lot 
of others, a lot of others in an older generation has been rather frustrated over the years, disgusted with both parties, and they're being energized, energized by everybody together now that they're realizing that the end stage is getting closer for the system that we have. And that should encourage all of us because it's well grounded, it's sound, there's sound economics and sound constitutional principles, sound moral judgment about what we should do. At least in this crowd, I wouldn't expect anybody to boo me for suggesting that we have, a, uh, that we apply a golden rule to our foreign policy. <laughs> You know, John Adams said that uh, what we need is a, uh, a tireless, uh, irate minority. We don't need the majority. You need a minority because that's the way it is all the time because they energize the rest of the people. So it's never what we have today and even under communism, you don't have 51% voting for this. It's a irate majority, a minority that uh, emphasizes this. But this is what we have today. We, we have it and it's growing and we are influencing other people. We are in, in, in transition. I think Justin coming to Congress is representing this. There's going to be a lot more people coming to Congress. And if, if you look at what's happening across the country, we can't even keep track of it all. I go around the country, uh, th this really got moving about four years ago, but I meet people who are in office, they're state representatives and local offices, they're all over the place and, you, and this is wonderful. That's how a real revolution occurs. And ultimately, if these ideas are to prevail, they will not be Republican ideas. They have to be pervasive and invade both Democrats, independents, and Republicans alike, because that is what we're facing today. Nixon said it all when he claimed that the reason why he had to get us off the gold standard and put on wage and price controls, he said, we're all Keynesians now. But someday we have to reverse that. We need to people say, we all believe in the free market and sound money now. <laughs> And it's been said that an idea whose time has come, it cannot be stopped by anything military. The armies can't stop it, governments can't stop it. And I really do believe that these ideas whose time has come. And they're not brand new. I didn't invent them. They're, they're, they're not new. It's part of our American tradition. It's part of a tradition that's been going on for many hundreds of years. But these ideas have only been tested in a small manner. But the best test has been here in this country. And then we became the wealthiest and the largest middle class ever. And now, of course, the middle class is shrinking and we're greatly in debt, we're, we're getting poorer. So our test is going to fade unless we pick up those pieces and refine it. We don't have to go back to anything. We don't have to go back to the 19th century gold standard because there's a better understanding about gold and money than there ever was. There's better understanding of economic policies, entitlement system. So this is the reason that we put this, to, if we put this together and bring people together, uh, this is going to work. And that is what freedom does. It brings people together. We'll never agree on how we want to use our freedoms because we'll never agree in a room like this. There might be 50 different religious values and some with no Christian uh, uh, religious values at all. But freedom answers the question because we don't impose ourselves on other people. You do what you want. And this should be true not, uh, not only in religious values, but economic values. This idea that the government has to take care of us and protect us uh, from ourselves and make sure no single person falls through the crack. The more they pr try to prevent people from falling through the crack, the more people fall through the cracks. That's what the problem is. <laughs> So we don't want to tell other people how to spend their money. Does that mean some won't do a good job and they might have problems? That, that is true. But it will also incite people to do more for themselves. They will have a greater incentive and there will be a family responsibility, a community responsibility, a more local responsibility. There will be greater wealth in a country. There is no doubt 
it, that history shows that the freer a country, the wealthier a country. And we've lost the moral high ground because we give it up to people who say, no, the only way you can spread fairness around the world and around this country is by government force, by forcibly redistributing wealth and regulating. It doesn't work. It leads to the crisis that we have here today. So therefore, we have to have a firmer grasp of how freedom works, how the marketplace works, and why you have to have sound money. And it will change. That's all there is to it. But that's where we're making the great progress. This is why it is so wonderful what is happening. We should be optimistic about it, but not casual about it. We can't say this is going to be easy because those who are in charge and who have control of the money system and control of the financial system and control of the military and, and the foreign policy, they will not go away quietly. And yet, this will end because, like I said the other night on TV, they don't accept, the, uh, the opposition won't accept the moral and the constitution argument they will not be able to get away from the economic argument because this can't go on because we won't have the money to pursue these policies. Benjamin Franklin once said, those who expect to uh, enjoy the fruits of liberty must, like man, undergo the fatigue of supporting it. So there is some fatigue. I don't like to call it sacrifice, but there is some fatigue. And there is some effort. So in many ways, those of you who would come to a meeting like this are, have a greater responsibility because the masses out there will not be understanding the same things that you do. So if you understand this, you have to bear the burden of the responsibility of doing something about it because it's a greater burden. But if you believe in it, that's what has to happen. And a lot of people come up to you and say, okay, what do you want me to do? And you know, my answer is, do whatever you want to do. <laughs> do what you want. Everybody, everybody will have a have a different uh, different role to play. Some will run for Congress, other offices, some will support people, some will make a lot of money, encourage us by donating money. Who knows what people will do? But I think the most important thing that we all do, which I try very hard to do and continue to do, which I learned early on, is try to understand why you can, you, how you can place these arguments down and, 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 and uh, compete with the arguments. So it's education. Ultimately education is the test. But just think of what we have on nightly TV and I get frustrated because I never get asked questions from an Austrian economic viewpoint but they haven't been taught it most of them don't even have the biggest idea what they are so this is this is the thing so education is important then you say well then what I do well I'll tell you what there'll be something for you one way or the other and uh, that is what's so wonderful and I really do believe it brings people together it should be a diverse group because everybody's going to use their freedoms in a different way socially or economically people should come together so we should come together to fight for the principle which we can all enjoy in a different manner and that is enjoying the liberty that we have gotten in a natural God-given way I thank you very much for coming today <laughs>